Princess and Dragon, Hasty Cake Club. Stand your ground, you useless lot. Bourbon's harsh voice cut through the cursed forest. The time has come for the curse of Tartan to awaken in that cave. If you fail to find it, well, I'll have no reason to set you free, will I? His threat sent chills down my spine. Please, let this be a dream. I traced the rune of obedience Bourbon had etched into the nape of my neck. The slave number 101 was coldly engraved in the rune, and on the day it was carved, my name vanished. A tingling sensation spread from the rune throughout my body. If I didn't obey Bourbon's words, this rune would burrow deeper and deeper, leading to certain death. They said this forest was cursed. Seems they were right. Looking around, I saw twisted trees and dying plants. Cold snowflakes drifted through the air, and despite it being daytime, darkness loomed. Is that... is that where we're supposed to go? I looked up at the trembling voice of another slave soldier. In the heart of the cursed forest, halfway up a massive rocky mountain, the entrance to a dark cave was visible, a low, prolonged wail emanated from the cave carried by the wind. The sound was like someone's agonised moan, or perhaps the growl of a beast. With a quivering voice, gripped by fear, I said, kick, 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 Can you hear that? We'll all die if we stay here. Oh, do shut up. Your whining is driving me mad. The slave numbered twenty-eight beside me glared with an irritated voice. S sorry I mumbled, wiping away tears. I only came because they promised food and a place to sleep. I never thought we'd be dragged to a place like this. We all did, he sighed. What's the use in regretting it now? In the distance, atop a hill, I could see Berban and his partner, Juan. Berban? Have you lost your mind? Their conversation drifted faintly on the wind. The curse of Taten? That's just a legend, a tale from decades ago. Burban laughed mockingly. You fool, look at this ancient scroll. With this we can tame the power of the curse. With that power we could overthrow this empire. You mean to enslave the curse of Tarten? Juan's voice trembled. Their conversation continued, but we had no luxury to pay attention to it. As we approached the cave entrance, an eerie feeling washed over us. Bourbon's command echoed behind the hesitating slave soldiers. Enter. At that moment, the rune on my neck burned hotter. I tried to steady my quivering voice. Everyone, if we stick together, we might make it back alive. But my words were drowned out by the terrified cries of my comrades. Step by step, we entered the temple, gripped by fear. My heart was pounding furiously. No, could this be my end? As we stepped into the cave, cold air bit into our skin. Beneath our feet, scattered remains of bones and flesh seemed to foretell the fate of previous visitors. A faint red glow seeped from the depths, and the sight it illuminated nearly stopped my heart. The cave walls were lined with countless undead, a veritable nightmare. Their sunken eyes were fixed on us, though they remained motionless for now. Quiet, whispered a slave ahead. They're sensitive to sound. I took each step on trembling legs. Holding my breath, I scanned our surroundings, but the undead's gaze seemed to follow us relentlessly. Clink! A small sound came from behind. A slave soldier had stumbled, rolling a pebble. The tiny stone rolled to the feet of an undead. Bloody hell, number 28, you idiot. Someone's curse erupted, and suddenly the entire cave began to stir. The undead turned towards us, a low growl escaping their lips. They began to lunge at us, their rotting flesh hanging loose. Ah! Get away! Help! Number 28's scream echoed through the cave. His cry seemed to trigger a trap, exploding the situation. The undead surged towards us like a tidal wave. The slave soldiers desperately resisted, but it was futile. 
even number 28. 17, known for his strength, fell in an instant. Terrified, I looked around for an escape route. My heart pounded in my ears and my legs felt ready to give way at any moment. Then I saw number 28 being surrounded by the undead. I have to help you at least. Before I could comprehend his words, I felt my throat being squeezed. I struggled for breath, but it was useless. The terrified strength of number 28 was unbelievably powerful. Number 28, don't, please. My pleas echoed in vain. Number 28 lifted me up and threw me into the midst of the undead horde. The world seemed to spin slowly. I felt suspended in mid-air, seeing only the pale faces and hungry eyes of the undead before me. Tumbled to the ground, shouting at number 28. You bloody madman, why are you doing this? But it was too late. Number 28 and the other slaves were fleeing in the opposite direction. The undead were slowly, but surely, approaching me. Rotting flesh, skeletal bones, and glowing red eyes. The stench of death assaulted my nostrils. I can't die like this. With trembling hands, I drew the dagger from my waist. I swung wildly at the skeleton before me, but my arm shook too much to aim properly. Please, please! A scream and plea burst from me involuntarily. The dagger grazed the skeleton's ribs. I swung it two, three times, slicing through the air, but missed each time. Why, why can't I hit it? After several attempts, the dagger finally struck the skeleton's skull. With a cracking sound, the skull fell to the floor. Ah! I nearly dropped the dagger in shock. In that moment, a zombie's rotting arm brushed my face, and as I instinctively stepped back, I almost tripped over bones on the floor. Barely regaining my balance, I swung the dagger again. This time, I luckily hit the zombie's arm, and a piece of rotten flesh caught on the dagger fell off. Ha! Huh. Ha! Huh. As I caught my breath, I suddenly realised something was odd. Despite my clumsy attacks, they weren't trying to harm me. Instead, they were standing still, watching me. What? What's going on? Then, as if pulled by an invisible force, the undead began to move in unison. Soon, they surrounded me as if with a single will. I tried to step back, but it was too late. Cold hands grabbed my limbs, and in an instant I was lifted into the air. Let go. Where are you taking me? My screams echoed off the cave walls before fading away. There was no one to answer. The undead began to run deeper into the cave, carrying my body, into the darkness, into even deeper darkness. Overwhelming everything around him. One side. Someone must have informed on our plans. Idrif could snap the neck of the Curse of Tarten in an instant and present it to the Emperor. Bourbon's face contorted. Damn it, it can't end like this. The power we've searched for so long. Juan grabbed Bourbon's arm. We've no time to waste. If you value your life more than that grand plan, we must flee now. We can't face Idrif. Bourbon hesitated for a moment, then nodded. They fled into the forest leaving behind the lifeless slaves. Not long after Bourbon and Juan disappeared, Idrif slowly approached the cave entrance. His steps were quiet, but the very air seemed to freeze around him. Lord Idrif, is the curse of Tartan we've been searching for really in here? asked an imperial commander. Idrif replied, Yes. A subtle smile flickered across Idrif's lips, but his voice carried no emotion. Search the cave. Yes, Lord Idrif. As soon as he spoke, the soldiers moved swiftly. Idrif scanned the surroundings once more with his deep eyes, then disappeared into the cave, his long robe swirling behind him. We really needed to find. Number 40 stepped back in surprise. You, what are you? How do you know these things? You're strange. We got here too easily, as if you knew this place. His words confused me too. Honestly, I don't know either. I just hope this crazy luck continues. Maybe we can find the curse of Tartan and break this rune of obedience. Just then, we heard a commotion from afar. Sharp sounds of clashing weapons and agitated shouts echoed off the cave walls. 
feeling the back of my neck go cold with tension. I muttered, What is that sound? At that moment, number 40, who had gone to check the situation, came running back, panting. His face was contorted with fear, and his sweat-soaked hair clung to his forehead. He shouted in an urgent voice. It's... it's the Imperial Army! He cried, barely catching his breath. They're coming this way, mercilessly slaughtering the undead. If we stay here, we'll die by the Imperial Swords too. We're just slaves to them. What? The Imperial Army? I asked in disbelief. Why is the Imperial Army here? But there was no time to ponder that now. The light from the magic circle was growing stronger. Suddenly, a crazy thought crossed my mind. I took a deep breath and said with a resolute expression, Look, we have no choice. Let's activate this magic circle and release the curse of Tartan. What? Number 40 looked at me with surprised eyes. Think about it. If the curse is released, chaos will ensue. We might be able to escape in the confusion, and I need to go to Bourbon to break this rune of obedience, Number 40 asked in a trembling voice. But is that possible, and won't we be in danger too, if we release the curse? We can't be in more danger than we are now, I said firmly. Isn't it better to take a chance than die trapped here? We're destined to die anyway. At least this way, we have a chance to live. With trembling hands, I began to match the southern cross pattern. My palms were so sweaty that the stone plates felt slippery. Suddenly, the magic circle began to glow brightly, and mysterious characters appeared floating in the air. What? What kind of writing is this? To number 40's question, I answered in a tense voice. This seems to be the language of dragons. I've never seen it before, but I feel like I can read it somehow. I slowly circled the magic circle, stumbling over the words as I began to read. Va. Valentina. A. Uh, Adelite. Von. Kreisen. As soon as I finished mumbling the words, the light of the magic circle flashed explosively and then dispersed. An unbelievable sight unfolded before our eyes. Inside a massive crystal structure, not a legendary monster, but a woman of breathtaking beauty lay sleeping. Her hair was a blend of golden sunlight and pale pink, reminiscent of spring cherry blossoms. Her face was as serene as a calm lake. Beneath the shadow cast by her long eyelashes, her face glowed faintly like moonlight, preserving youth as if time had stopped. We gazed at this unbelievable sight, holding our breath. Who would have thought the being called the Curse of Tartan could be so beautiful? Is this really the Curse of Tartan? Ah, she's beautiful. As if answering my question, number 40 muttered in a voice of awe, swallowing hard. My heart raced with anticipation and tension at the thought of awakening the curse of Tartan. We've done it. We're free now. I said to number 40 in an excited voice, Let's tell Bourbon. Tell him we've found the curse of Tartan. At that moment, number 40's expression subtly changed. Something flashing in his eyes made me uneasy. No, he said slowly. That won't work. The Imperial Army is already coming. Maybe Bourbon has already, his voice lowered, fled, or he's already dead at the hands of the Imperial Army. A chill ran down my spine at his words. What is he saying now of all times? How can you be so sure when we've come this far? Let's just get out of here quickly. This cave, it's giving me the creeps. Silence fell. Number 40 slowly raised his head to look at me. His gaze began to change. At first it was a subtle change, but it became more and more distinct. The eyes that had been full of fear and anxiety grew cold. How am I so sure? The corner of number 40's mouth twisted. Because I know, I'm the one who called the Imperial Army. What? Why? How could a slave soldier call the Imperial Army? My voice trembled. My mind was in chaos. I'm Darren, an Imperial spy. 
I disguised myself as a slave soldier after receiving intelligence that Bourbon was trying to awaken the curse of Tartin. I was ordered to find the curse before Bourbon. You were imperial all along. As I spoke with a voice mixed with confusion and fear, Number 40's face contorted in the darkness, and in an instant, a dagger appeared in his hand. The silver blade flashed ominously, reflecting the dim light of the cave. I instinctively stepped back, my heart pounding in my ears. Yes, and to think a mere slave managed to find the curse. I'm afraid I can't let you live. Wait, I'm just a slave who knows nothing. I don't care who you are or what you want, I just want to live. Instead of answering, Darren swung his sword. I barely managed to twist my body to avoid it, but with the sound of tearing fabric a sharp pain grazed my arm. Feeling blood slowly trickling down I hastily drew my dagger, but it was no match for his agile movements. Listen, you discovered the curse of Tartan. I know nothing, I've seen nothing, please, I pleaded, panting. No, you've already seen too much. Now that you know about the curse of Tartan, I can't let you live. With his words, the sharp blade flew towards me once again. I desperately tried to dodge, but Darren's sword struck my dagger forcefully. With a sharp, cracking sound, my dagger broke and flew away. Seizing the opportunity, Darren's sharp blade pierced through my back. Gah! I crawled on the floor, coughing up blood. The sensation of the cold stone floor against my skin grew increasingly faint. As despair, washed over me, pain swept through my entire body. My vision began to blur. Please, I mumbled weakly. Farewell. You're just a nameless slave who will be forgotten. No one will remember your existence. Is this how it ends? If only I had power, it wouldn't have ended like this. These useless thoughts now dulled with each fading heartbeat. An intense light covered my vision. As I exhaled my last breath, I felt a deep fatigue, too weak even to close my eyelids, and everything disappeared into darkness. Consciousness slowly returned in the darkness. When I opened my eyes, my surroundings were blurry. As I struggled to regain my senses, the surrounding noise became clearer. That, that's the curse of Tartan, I heard someone shout. Amidst the confusion, a familiar voice reached my ears. When I opened my eyes, an unfamiliar scene unfolded. My vision was strangely high, and looking at my hands, I saw long, delicate fingers with a soft glow around them. These weren't my hands, or more precisely, they weren't my old hands. We've surrounded it. The curse of Tartan has awakened. The curse of Tartan? Where? I muttered in bewilderment. My voice sounded strangely unfamiliar. Looking around, I saw soldiers who appeared to be from the Imperial Army surrounding me. Their weapons were pointed at me, but why were they aiming at me? What is this? As I saw the corpse lying on the ground, everything became clear. That corpse was me. The slave soldier me betrayed and brutally murdered. This, this can't be... A sound that was neither a cry nor a scream burst from deep in my throat. Number 40's betrayal, his cold smile, the pain of the blade piercing my back. All the memories came flooding back like a tidal wave. How, how could you? I just wanted to live. As my voice cracked, the air around began to vibrate. The Imperial soldiers looked at each other with uneasy eyes. Then, the Imperial commander's shout rang out. Fire! In an instant, a rain of arrows darkened the sky. Hundreds of arrowheads flew towards me. In that moment, as if time had stopped, a power swirling inside me exploded outwards. In the blink of an eye, the surrounding air froze and purple flames enveloped my body. How dare you? With words I muttered unknowingly, a wave of magical power struck the surroundings. The arrows stopped mid-air, instantly turning to ash and scattering. I'll destroy you all! My voice, distorted with rage, echoed throughout the cave. The Imperial soldiers retreated in terror, their weapons instantly froze and shattered, and their armour tore like paper. Fall back! 
the commander shouted, but it was too late. I raised my hand, and a wave of purple energy engulfed the soldiers. In an instant they turned into ice statues and shattered. As the magical wave subsided, the surroundings were in chaos. The Imperial soldiers were either fleeing in panic or hiding behind rocks, trembling. Lord Idrif. I turned to see number 40, Darren. You managed to survive, you bastard. I tried to unleash my magic towards Darren again. That power that had burst out by chance earlier, I wanted to summon that intense magic once more. But no matter how hard I tried, no matter how desperately I wished, no magic came forth. Meanwhile, Darren ran to someone, shouting desperately, Lord Idrif, here, here's the curse of Tarten, I found it. The man called Idrif was slowly approaching, dressed in pitch black clothes. A blue pendant hanging at his waist emitted a mysterious light, and the fur flowing over his shoulders added to his dignity the imperial insignia clearly visible on his clothes. He was clearly not a mere soldier but a high-ranking mage. Though no weapon was visible, his presence alone was overwhelmingly intimidating. I guarded it till the end. We must deal with it quickly. At that moment, everything became clear. It felt like puzzle pieces were fitting together in my head. So Darren had tried to kill me on that man's orders. That person was the real mastermind. Only then could I see the whole picture. Darren was just a subordinate, and that man had been controlling everything. The curse of Tarten, the destruction of my life. It was all this one person's plan. Amidst Darren's constant flattery and excuses, Idrif's expression changed subtly. You're noisy. Idrif's voice was low and cold. With his words, the surrounding air seemed to freeze instantly. As Idrif's gaze, which had been fixed on me, reached Darren, a bright flash sparkled at his head, spun around and he collapsed to the ground. Idrif glanced at the fallen Darren once, then turned back to me. Now, it's just the two of us. Idrif approached with a dark smile. My heart started to race and cold sweat ran down my spine. This person is definitely strong. His very existence is a threat. Suddenly, I felt the strength draining from my body. It was as if an invisible hand was taking away all the energy inside me. My legs started to tremble and my arms hung heavily. From the moment this Idrif appeared, that powerful strength from earlier seemed to have vanished without a trace. What's this? Why isn't it working? I muttered in confusion. I couldn't hide the trembling in my voice. When Idrif leaned towards me, close enough to feel his breath, his blurry silhouette became clear, revealing an unrealistically perfect face. My heart started pounding at those eyes of unfathomable depth. Please calm down, this man is dangerous. My body no longer felt like my own. Helplessness and fear enveloped my entire being. It felt like sinking deeper and deeper into a quagmire. I could only wait for his next move. Is this the end of my fate? A desperate thought crossed my mind. His red eyes seemed to pierce through the confusion in my soul. That's when it happened. With the sound of a fluttering cloak, he strongly embraced me. At that moment, everything seemed to stop. His embrace gave a strange feeling where comfort and threat coexisted. His body heat transferred to my cold skin. It felt as if time had frozen. His embrace gave a strange feeling where comfort and threat coexisted. The contradictory sensation of warmth and danger made my mind go blank. I barely managed to gather my wits and force out a voice, but contrary to my intention, it came out weak and trembling. L let let me go. As I belatedly struggled, he stroked my head. His touch was surprisingly gentle. As if trying to calm me, he made a soft shh sound between his lips. It was strange. With that touch, the chaotic emotions that had crashed like waves suddenly calmed. Anger, fear, and an inexplicable longing. These mixed feelings settled down quietly. Soon after, hot moisture seeped into my eyes, independent of my will. Why am I like this? 
Before more questions could squeeze in, I was gradually entrusting my body to the man, as if handing over my weight to him. The man's arms, gently wrapped around me, gladly welcomed me. As I nestled deep into his arms, that enveloped me, a low, resonant voice came from the man who had been silent for a long time. Valentina. At that moment, a powerful wave from Idrif's large hand pierced through my head. Gah! The sound of my heartbeat echoed in my head, and a scream-like cry burst from my throat. Ah! Countless scenes flashed before my eyes, and I heard Idrif muttering something like an incantation. His voice seemed both distant and close. He's going to kill me. At this rate, I'll be devoured by this man. Fear surged again. The instinct to survive flowed through my entire body. No. The moment I decided to push away the force trying to enter, a strong explosive sound separated us from the man's embrace I couldn't escape. As if an explosion had occurred, the man was pushed far away, and I too fell backward from the impact. Fallen on the ground, I breathed heavily. My whole body was shaking. Idrif slowly rose with an elegant movement. His expression was unreadable, but a different light dwelled in those red eyes. Who are you, really? I answered in a trembling voice. I... I'm... a slave... soldier. I trailed off and lowered my head. Idrif raised an eyebrow and approached again. The sound of his boots hitting the floor echoed in the cave. My heart started beating wildly, as if to drown out that sound. I could only tightly grip the dirt floor with my hands. Rough soil grains were gripped in my hand, and the more I squeezed, the deeper I felt the stinging texture. Are you sure? His voice was mixed with doubt. I lowered my head, avoiding the man's gaze. Slave Soldier 101 was dead. Then who am I? A moment of silence passed. Only the sound of water dripping from afar could be heard. While he paused, his feet came into view at the edge of my vision. The man's gaze dropped for a moment, as if thinking of something. I quickly seized the opportunity to throw the dirt I had gripped into his face. The dust scattered in the air, reflecting dim light. Ugh. Wait, wait a moment. The man shouted, squinting his eyes. Taking advantage of the momentary confusion, I quickly turned and fled. My bare feet were scraped against the rough cave floor, but I ran without even feeling the pain. Huff. Huff. Rough breathing filled my ears, and hot heat throbbed in my head. As I escaped the cave, the cold outside air struck my face. What lay before me was a cliff at the end of a steep hill. A vast plain stretched out under the blue sky, and a train running across it looked as small as a toy. Gasp. There's no other choice. Huff. Huff. The wind whistled past my ears, and the surrounding scenery blurred quickly. Gaining momentum, I managed to reach the railroad tracks visible in the distance. Just then, a train was slowing down as it made a sharp turn along the curved tracks. Black smoke rose to the sky with the roar of the steam engine. Thump, 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 thump. I ran until the train noise grew close enough to make my whole body vibrate. I was out of breath. I could see the back of a man standing on the last car of the train. His green cloak fluttered in the wind. Hey, 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 back here, please help me. I shouted at the top of my lungs. I was worried my voice wouldn't reach him because of the wind. The man looked around as if he had misheard, then turned back and yelled. What? Through his windswept brown hair, I met his surprised dark blue eyes. Please, let me on. I'm being chased by attackers. Hurry! The man looked around, seeming flustered, then took out a stone from his pocket and threw it at me. The stone flew directly towards my head. Come on! Throwing a stone out of nowhere is too much. But then... With a cracking sound, a magic circle expanded from the stone. Blue magical patterns were drawn in the air. My whole body floated up and instantly moved towards the man. The surrounding scenery blurred. The man wrapped his arm around my waist to prevent me from falling as I floated in the air. I gasped in surprise at the strength of his arm. Hold tight. 
As I held on firmly at the man's words, he embraced me with much stronger force than expected, and in an instant I was safely on the train in his arms. Thud. The thank you. I barely managed to speak while gasping for breath. My heart was still beating wildly. Don't mention it. The man smiled brightly as if it was nothing. His smile was as dazzling as his hair glistening in the sunlight. With the blue sky as a backdrop, he looked like a prince from a fairy tale. In the last freight car of the train, snow-covered forests quickly passed by beyond the window. The cursed forest. I'm finally escaping it. Leaning my forehead against the cold glass, I exhaled deeply. The me who entered the forest and the me now were completely different. From a slave soldier to the curse of Taten, the irony of fate brought a bitter smile to my lips. It's good to be reborn after a meaningless death, but to awaken as the being destined to destroy the Empire. Just then, the stranger's voice scattered my thoughts. Hey, where's your master that I should be thanking? Master, I don't have a master. I answered in as calm a tone as possible, but it was difficult to hide the distinctive accent in my voice. Ah, oh, pardon me. Your manner of speech sounded just like a slave's. The man's words made me tense up instantly. Even though I had awakened in a new body, the nature of a slave seemed like an indelible brand. You're right. Actually, I'm looking for a master. How about it? Would you take me as your slave? What did you say? The man's eyes wavered. Ignoring this, I forced a smile and continued. I'm strong and healthy. I'm confident I can do any kind of work. Are you serious? Yes. Instead of answering, the man looked at me with an incredulous expression when the brief silence was filled only by the rattling sound of the train. Ha! Huh. The man sighed as if exasperated and said, Do you think I'd fall for the words of an escaped slave? An escaped slave? I widened my eyes in feigned surprise, but inwardly I broke into a cold sweat. Had this man figured out my identity? Leaning against the cold, hard train wall, the man's sharp gaze pierced through me. A slave this fit and beautiful, without a master, whatever the situation, I don't want to get involved. I'll have to report this. Unconsciously, my hand moved to my neck. I felt for the place where the rune of obedience had once been engraved, but of course there was no trace on this new body. I was filled with self-loathing at the fact that I, who had longed for freedom, was now trying to become a slave again. But as he had instantly noticed, it would also be reckless for me, who couldn't even shake off a slave's manner of speech, to live as a free person without preparation. As the man turned away indifferently, I hastily grabbed his arm. Wait, I'll tell you. Who I really am, I'm not an escaped slave. I'm not certain, but this might be my only identity. I, I am the curse of Taten. The man's hand paused. Doubt and curiosity crossed his eyes. The curse of Taten? Yes, I am the curse of Taten who awoke in the cursed forest. That's why I was being chased by the Imperial Army when I met you. The man looked at me with a surprised expression for a moment, then burst into laughter. Why, why are you laughing? Don't you know about the curse of Tarten? I'm telling you, I'm the curse of Tarten that's said to bring ruin to the Empire. Oh, I know, I know. The curse of Tarten. They say it's so formidable that the Imperial Army can't even touch it, and foolhardy adventurers waste their lives trying to find it. I never imagined the curse of Tarten would look like this. It's true, I definitely awoke in there, and all the Imperial soldiers who touched me lost their lives. For a moment, the image of the Imperial soldiers dying in an instant made me nauseous, but I managed to continue speaking. Is that so? Then you should be able to harm me right now, right? The man held up his arm that I was holding and said, Go ahead. What? I said, go ahead. If you're really the curse of Tartan, try blasting off this arm that saved you. Then I'll believe you. Looking at my hesitation, the man smiled leisurely. Claiming to be a curse with eyes that look like they've never killed even a bug. Figures. Something stirred within me at his provocative words. Tiny ice crystals began to bloom at my fingertips, instantly transforming into purple energy. That's not true. I'm just considering how to blast off your armour without killing you. 
Ugh, such bravado. The man, unaware of the magic, lightly shook off my hand and turned away. At that moment, a purple light flashed on his arm and the sound of metal shattering rang out. One of the man's arm guards split sharply, scattering pieces on the floor. Clang, 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 bang. The sound of metal fragments hitting the floor filled the compartment. Do you believe me now? The man checked his arm, moving it back and forth as if he couldn't believe it. An awkward smile spread across his face. No, I don't. I told you to blast off my arm. Stop with the bravado. Next time it'll be this neck. My hand moved towards his neck. Ah, calm down. Isn't shattering my mithril armour enough? Humph. Let's get back to the point. If you don't want to take me as a slave, then become my slave. An annoyed expression flashed across the man's face. Become your slave? Ha! Hey, do you know how expensive the teleportation runestone I used on you was? Is this how you treat someone who just saved you? At his words, I hesitated for a moment. Feeling my fingertips trembling, I struggled to choose my next words. If not a slave, what kind of proposal should I make? But at that moment, the man quickly lunged and subdued me. His movement was like that of a skilled predator. In an instant, I was knocked to the floor and his weight pressed down on my body. Now that you're in a position to talk civilly, I don't understand. If you really are such a powerful being, why would you volunteer to be a slave? Doubt and curiosity crossed his eyes, now close enough for me to feel his breath. The cold touch of metal brushed against my neck. It was the man's dagger. I caught my breath and answered. You were the one who mistook me for a slave after hearing my manner of speech. What else could happen to me without a master? That's why I needed a proper status. The man's eyebrow raised slightly. A subtle change appeared in his expression. Well, I initially helped you thinking I'd get a reward from your master. Not a slave, but money. There was a slight wavering in his voice. I seized this opportunity to counter. Helping a passerby and then asking for money, are you a beggar? At my words, the man's face reddened for a moment. What? How dare you? I'm just a mercenary swordsman who doesn't move without compensation. But I really have nothing, I said, maintaining an innocent expression while inwardly smiling at his reaction. The man sighed and shook his head. Well, then I guess my luck was really bad. Just then, I noticed the necklace around my neck faintly glowing. The softly shining object still seemed to have some value. Do you know a place that gives fair prices for items? Items? You have something special? I'd like to sell this necklace to reward you. How about accompanying me until then? The man thought for a moment, then nodded. An interesting proposal. As it happens, we should get off here. Here? Yes, this is Morencia Station. I know a weapon shop that also deals in stolen goods. We can get your necklace appraised there. All right, let's go there then. The train slowly reduced speed, and the view of Morencia Station began to appear outside the window. Just before getting off the train, the man leaned towards me and whispered in a low voice. When we get off, follow me quietly. I won't tolerate even the slightest mistake. Why so cautious? We're fair dodgers right now. It'll be troublesome if we're caught. What? You really were a beggar? As my voice rose slightly, the man frowned. You're in no position to talk. You rode along too. That's true, but now I understand why you're so obsessed with money. Right. As long as you understand, don't ever forget it. Morencia Weapons Shop. Afternoon. As we entered the shop, a wave of hot air hit us. In front of the forge, a large blacksmith was striking red-hot iron with a clang-clang. The sound was almost deafening. The man approached a short, stout man sitting at the counter next to it. The man, who appeared to be the owner, was polishing a large sword so diligently that his face was reflected in it. Excuse me. When the man tapped the counter, the shopkeeper looked up, startled. Oh my, welcome! I was so distracted by that noise. Hey, can you stop working for a bit? As the blacksmith stopped hammering with an embarrassed expression, the owner smiled brightly. What brings you here? I was hoping you could repair this. 
As the man pulled out the broken pieces of armour, the owner's eyes widened. My, to reduce Mitheril to this state, whose handiwork is this? The man glanced at me, then rested his chin on his hand and answered with a nonchalant expression. It wasn't me. You must be doing some rough work. Let's see. To fix it all, it'll be 100 gold. What? It's just the arm part. Why so expensive? It's Mitheril, young man. Do you know how tricky it is to work with? I'm only charging this much because it's partial. The repair cost seems higher than expected. I'm not sure if the necklace will cover it, but I can only hope it will. Will this be enough for the repair? The weapon shop owner examined the necklace with a magnifying glass, looking puzzled at first, then surprised. After a long examination, he spoke. Where did you get this? Why? It doesn't matter if it's of unknown origin, right? His expression grew increasingly serious. Usually, that's true. But this... this belongs to the Tartinus royal family. It's a princess's necklace. Princess? I repeated, surprised by the unexpected word. Here, under this crest, what does it say? Read it. The man took the magnifying glass and began to read slowly. Valentina Adelite von Kreisen. May glory be eternal. It belongs to Princess Valentina, daughter of the former emperor, Tartinus Leichhardt. I realised that the letters matched those that appeared when I awakened the curse of Tartan. So Valentina was my real name. Then I remembered the moment Idrif called me Valentina. Confirming it. He clearly knew something. The man scratched the back of his head with a puzzled expression and asked the merchant, So you're saying the curse of Tartan was actually a princess? That's right. The princess had such tremendous power that the current emperor could only seal her away. That's why they call her the curse of Tartan, warning that if she awakens the empire will fall. Wow, you're really knowledgeable, mister. When dealing with stolen goods, this kind of knowledge is basic for value assessment. So, will you buy it? Well, I still need some safeguards. I need to know the exact source to buy it. Is that important for stolen goods? There are some groups obsessed with Princess Valentina. They're mystics who buy up anything related to the princess veiled as the curse of Tartan. But it's so dangerous and rare that without a source, it's hard to get a proper price. Well? The man glanced at me, cleared his throat, and answered. My lover here found it. Anything more than that is private, I'm afraid. Lover? Me? Yours? I asked in a whisper, trying to hide my shocked expression. The man looked at me tenderly and smiled. A small whisper escaped between his lips. Just go along with it. Why can he improvise like this without warning? I grabbed his hand, secretly pinching it hard while laughing along. Ouch! That's right. We found it when we were dating in a dungeon. We enjoy thrills, you know. Still holding the man's hand tightly, I gently rubbed his hand against my cheek and looked at the merchant with loving eyes. The man's face suddenly reddened, clearly flustered. We explored every nook and cranny. Oh, the dungeon, of course. The man now seemed completely bewildered, not knowing what to do. His ears turned red too. But you know what? Strangely, all I can remember is my lover's powerful movements. When I see him wielding that long sword so freely, I just lose my mind, you know. The man covered his blushing face with one hand, so I can't remember which dungeon it was at all. Well, that's not important, is it? The merchant narrowed his eyes and said, Right, so this necklace is worth five gold. I let go of the man's hand without hesitation. I sensed immediately that my act hadn't worked. Five gold? Just that? The man asked in surprise. Gold after deducting the risk premium. There must be a reason for all that vagueness, I said, not hiding my irritation. Humph, then there's nothing more to say. I won't sell it. Give me back the necklace. 
As I reached for the items on the counter, the merchant pressed down on the necklace, stopping me. No, you can't leave like this. Why are you suddenly like this? I said I'm not selling. There's no such thing as deal cancelled in my shop. Either quietly take the five gold and go, or leave without a penny and something broken. What kind of nonsense is? Thump, thump, thump. The large blacksmith approached with heavy footsteps. The hammer in his hand gleamed threateningly. The man, true to his swordsman nature, placed his hand on the sword at his waist without backing down. Such a dirty trick. Are you sure about this? The merchant grinned and said, Heh, that guy only knows metalwork. He won't treat you as a person. Either quietly take fifty and go, or leave without a penny and something broken. Your choice. As the tension reached its breaking point, I hastily stopped the man. Wait, this will only make things more complicated. The man glanced at me and muttered lowly. It will be over soon. Step back. In an instant, the man and the blacksmith charged at each other with a battle cry, the sound of air being torn and their rough breathing intertwined. I stretched out both hands between them and desperately shouted, Everyone! Stop! As I shouted, purple energy swirled and exploded from my fingertips. Like an invisible wave sweeping through the room, a powerful unseen force spread in all directions. Crash! Bang! The bodies of the man and the blacksmith rose into the air like dolls. As if an invisible giant hand had swept them away, they flew far to the left and right, their eyes mixed with surprise and fear. The man rolled his body quickly as if doing a somersault, and landed gracefully. On the other hand, the blacksmith flew far to the opposite side and ended up sitting on top of the merchant. The blacksmith muttered with a dumbfounded expression. Did... did she throw me? Me? The merchant screamed in pain from under the blacksmith. Ah, get off! Move away, I said. The blacksmith tried to get up, but suddenly his face contorted and he screamed. Ah, my leg! I can't move it! Tears started to flow from his eyes. The large blacksmith began to cry loudly like a child. Please, get us out of here. I'll buy the necklace for five hundred gold. Observing the situation, I tried to appear calm as I spoke. One thousand gold, then I'll help you. What? Double? You thieving git. Five hundred gold in cash, the rest for armour repair and equipment I need. The merchant yelled in an enraged voice. You trash my shop and now you're trying to rip me off? Are you trying to put me out of business? I spoke with a threatening look. Or you can wait like that until the Merchant's Guild arrives, reported for unfair trade practices. Ugh. Fine. We'll do it your way. Just get this bloke off me quickly. Oh, my back. The man said admiringly. Not too shabby, eh? I replied nonchalantly. No big deal. Shortly after, with the blacksmith's help, the man was fitted with repaired armour, and I too changed into new clothes. I'm all changed as well. As I appeared in my new look, the man stared at me with a blank expression and said, That was... quick. Then the merchant approached Edwin closely and whispered secretly, But... your lover... watch out! Why's that? asked with a pretend concerned look at the merchant's meaningful words. Her strength is terrifying. Be careful living with her. The man seemed momentarily flustered but soon smiled and answered. That's exactly why I fell for her. At his words, the merchant shook his head and sighed. As we left the weapon shop, we heard his muttering behind us. Youth today, utterly reckless. As we turned into a quiet alley after leaving the weapon shop, I asked the man as if I could no longer hold back. My voice tried to maintain forced calmness, but the discomfort in it was undisguisable. So, why did you introduce me as your lover? The man smiled. There was a mischievous light in his brown eyes, and a somewhat mocking smile played at the corners of his mouth. You were willing to be a slave, but lover crosses the line. It's bloody annoying. I'd prefer being your slave, it'd be less embarrassing. Feeling my face redden, I turned my head away. Annoying? 
Oi, I'm not thrilled about it either. You're acting like I actually proposed or something. I'm not falling for you either. You've got some nerve. You say you don't like me, but you're fine with pretending to be my lover. The man looked at me directly and spoke firmly. His gaze became serious. If you're my lover, people won't dig too deeply into your unclear status as the curse of Tartan, especially me, an imperial citizen, having a former slave as a lover. Who would dare interfere with or question my private life? That reason makes even less sense. You could have me as a fake slave instead of a fake lover, so why insist on lover? The man's expression hardened slightly. You're quite persistent, aren't you? If being my lover is that uncomfortable, perhaps we should part ways here. I shook my head again. Something unsettling rose within me. Wait, there must be a specific reason it has to be lover, right? I've already revealed that I'm the curse of Tarten. Tell me more so I can cooperate. The man seemed flustered for a moment but soon spoke with a serious expression. Ah, well, the truth is, I ran away from an arranged marriage. Such marriages are common in my family, but I really disliked my intended partner. So I fled, but I could be dragged back at any time. And you think claiming me as your lover will make your family leave you alone? The man was silent for a moment before answering. Of course, they won't give up that easily, but my arranged marriage partner wants someone pure, so even if I'm caught, having a lover might help me avoid the marriage. They likely won't leave the lover alone, but you're strong, so I thought you could escape in a crisis. Ugh, I have no intention of taking your purity. Ah, that's why it's fake. I took a deep breath and spoke. Complicated emotions tangled in my heart. Anyway, you might be in more danger because of me. I'm being chased by the Imperial Army too. I was just a slave who woke up as the curse of Tarten without knowing why. The man nodded as he listened to my story. Then we need each other. I can protect you from the Imperial Army, and you can shield me from my family. How about we stick together until it's safe, as fake lovers and companions? After thinking for a moment, I made my decision. All right. Oh, I don't even know your name yet. Edwin Flannel. Call me Edwin, and you must be Valentina. That's right. Nice to meet you, Edwin. I nodded at Edwin's words. His blue eyes gazed at me intently. A subtle tension hung in the air during the silence. Why are you staring at me like that? Edwin sighed slightly and answered. To be honest, I still don't fully believe it. His voice carried a hint of doubt. Edwin's gaze sharpened. The curse of Tartan that will destroy the Empire. How great and fearsome must that power be? So I want to ask, do you want to destroy the Empire with that strong power? I could sense the wariness hidden in his question. I wanted to allay his suspicions. I shook my head and spoke firmly. Not at all. I've never even dreamed of such a thing. Edwin frowned slightly and asked again. Then is there any need to call yourself a curse? I'm not sure, but to shoulder my fate and write a new life, I think I need to tame this unstable power and uncover Princess Valentina's true identity. Are there any clues or people you might know about? His question triggered a fleeting memory of chilling eyes. Dark red irises, jet black hair contrasting with skin as white as snow. The moment he held me in his arms and called me Valentina flashed through my mind. The name Idrif unconsciously escaped my lips, causing an odd tremor in a corner of my heart. Idrif. That imperial mage seems to know my identity but I felt utterly powerless before him. Wait, have I gone mad? Am I considering asking an imperial soldier who's chasing me about my own identity? That's absurd. It's far too dangerous. If he continues to pursue me, it's too risky to approach him carelessly. I shook my head vigorously, clutching at my hair. No, no, could there be someone else? I desperately tried to think of another way, squeezing my eyes shut and furrowing my brow in deep thought. Edwin, who had been watching this scene, grew increasingly perplexed. His expression shifted from concern to bewilderment as he observed me muttering to myself, shaking my head and pulling at my hair. His eyebrows rose higher and higher. I could sense his expression becoming more peculiar, but I had no time to worry about that now. 
As I continued to rack my brains, another face suddenly came to mind. Bourbon. My voice gained strength. Bourbon, the dark mage who had enslaved me. His gloomy smile and the aura of darkness that always enveloped him vividly came to mind. Bourbon found the place where I was sealed. And if I remember correctly, he was trying to control that power. Perhaps I could learn about Valentina's past through him. That would be crucial information for me. But where did Burban disappear to when the Imperial Army barged in? Surely, he's not dead. I sighed involuntarily. My palms were clammy with cold sweat. Burban might be my only lead. I'm not sure if I want him to be alive or gone forever. Overwhelmed with mixed emotions, I could only sigh. Even if he were alive, I might be able to stand against him now that I've grown stronger. At any rate, I doubt he's more powerful than Idrif. And even if he were dead, I'd still want to find his corpse to glean even the smallest clue. Well, during my time as a slave, someone tasked me with finding the curse of Taten. He might know something. However, it's been quite a while, so I'm not sure if I can find him. Edwin thought for a moment before speaking. I could ask for help from my guild. It's a place where many people gather, so there's a good chance of getting information about that person. Really? Edwin, thank you so much. At that moment, thud, I lost my balance as I collided hard with an oncoming pedestrian. Ah! Edwin quickly caught me as I stumbled, his strong arm wrapped around my waist. I'm all right, thank you. Hey, are you blind? You should at least apologise. Edwin shouted angrily, but the pedestrian hurried away without even turning back. Concern clouded Edwin's eyes. Are you hurt anywhere? Only then did I realise Edwin's arm was still around my waist. No, I'm fine, but do we have to stay like this even as fake lovers? Edwin, seeming to recognise the situation, said playfully. Do you want to? As our eyes met, an awkward silence fell, and then the laughter that burst out made passers-by glance at us. Huh? Wait. What's wrong? I felt around my waist with an ominous premonition. Suddenly my heart seemed to sink. No, my bag is gone. All my money was in there. Damn it! It was that bastard! These Grimblin folk! Edwin's agile body flew like an arrow towards the pickpocket. His long legs quickly closed the distance. I tried to follow him, but he had long since disappeared into the crowd. Will he be able to get the bag back? Will Edwin be all right? Anxiety and worry washed over me. I took a deep breath and muttered, Wow, he's really fast. All right, I'll handle this my way. At times like this, I just need to make a shortcut. I looked around, breathing heavily. Suddenly, memories of growing up on the streets came back to me. The experience of jumping across buildings to quickly escape dangerous situations resurfaced. Following that instinct, instead of running down the street, I started climbing up the outer wall of a tall building. My palms stung as they scraped against the rough bricks, but adrenaline coursed through my body. After several clumsy missteps, I finally managed to reach a low roof. Quickly scanning the entire street from the high vantage point, I spotted someone who looked like the pickpocket in a corner alley. As I thought, he came this way. Now I can ambush him directly. I leapt across the narrow gaps between buildings and jumped straight down onto his head. Thud! Ouch! Ow! 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 What the... Where did you come from? The pickpocket's face contorted with pain and surprise. Shut up and give me back my money. Suddenly, purple magic emanating from my body enveloped everything around us as if swallowing it all. A rumbling energy wrapped around the pickpocket's arm, growing stronger. Ah! No! I can't use my power here! The pickpocket's piercing scream echoed. At this rate, he might break an arm. I desperately tried to control the magic, but the power that had already gone out of control showed no signs of stopping. In an instant, the surrounding scenery began to distort. Buildings seemed to melt like paint, and the ground rippled like water. 
it was as if the boundary between reality and unreality was collapsing. In the blink of an eye, I found myself standing in a completely different space. Under an endless purple sky, silver mist swirled beneath my feet. Faint stars seemed to twinkle in the distance and the air itself seemed to vibrate with magic. Ugh, what's this all of a sudden? My voice trembled with confusion. Looking around, the alleyway was nowhere to be seen, replaced by a mystical scene as if in a dream. Where is this? It was definitely an alley just now. At that moment, a man appeared before me. His black cloak, enveloping his entire body, fluttered elegantly even in this space without a breath of wind. His presence was overwhelming, sharp eyes, an enigmatic aura. He seemed familiar, as if I'd seen him before. Who? Where's that pickpocket? Long black hair I could never forget flowed over his shoulders, and piercing red eyes of unfathomable depth stared at me. Everything about him seemed to warn of danger, yet simultaneously drew me in with a strange allure. E you a familiar voice echoed. My heart pounded. I've finally found you. At that moment I recognised him, surprise and fear mixed in my voice. Idrif, how are you here? Long hair like darkness that could swallow everything, an imposing physique, eyes like a red moon, the man before me was Idrif. How did he find me after I ran so far? Overwhelmed by Idrif's presence, I unconsciously stepped back. His long hair fluttered elegantly even in this windless space, and his eyes of unfathomable depth seemed to pierce through me. Just as I was about to flee, his presence coolly approached behind me. As Idrif's scent brushed my nose, my heart raced. The smile on his lips was as cold and dangerous as moonlight. It's useless. This is a space connected only to you and me. What do you mean? Idrif's long fingers grasped my chin. As his touch gently brushed my skin, a shiver ran down my spine. Strong magic yearns for each other. His words filled me with anger, but at the same time, an unnamed emotion stirred within me. Desperately suppressing that feeling, I broke free from him and asked, Let go. Why are you chasing me? Is it because I'm the curse of Tartan? Idrif's eyes dangerously gleamed, and I found myself fixated on the cynical smile on his lips. That slightly upturned corner of his mouth seemed to hide a thousand secrets. Yes. The Imperial Army is searching every corner of the Empire. They say they're looking for the Curse of Ta Ten. A moment of silence passed. I swallowed hard and clenched my fists. Wait, you called me Valentina before. You know that the Curse of Ta Ten is actually the princess, don't you? He answered as if bursting into laughter. His amusement felt like mockery. Isn't it interesting? A princess hiding her slave status. What are you saying? I am Princess Valentina. His eyes gleamed dangerously. On that day when all the slave soldiers sent to the cursed forest died, the curse of Taten, Princess Valentina, awakened. I don't think this is a mere coincidence. My lower lip felt frozen, making it hard to open my mouth. Idrif questioned me as if interrogating. Slave Soldier 101, I don't know how you managed to enter that body. But where is the real Valentina's soul? I shook my head and answered. I don't know either. As you said, I was indeed a slave soldier. I just died in that forest and woke up in this body. Then you know nothing about the dragon either. Dragon? Idrif's gaze deepened. Fifty years ago, Emperor Baklava sought to eliminate the royal family of Tatenus. He succeeded in murdering Emperor Tatenus and his empress. But he did not halt there. The Emperor's gaze fell upon their daughter, Princess Valentina, whom he also intended to remove from the Empire. But he failed. A dragon took her and disappeared. Even now, the Emperor wants to find and eliminate the Princess, and the dragon he couldn't finish off. I blinked. A vague memory flashed through my mind. 
Come to think of it, when I discovered Princess Valentina, I remember seeing a dragon magic circle, but there was no actual dragon. Then where is the dragon? Idrif's lips twisted. Well, Princess Valentina would know well. I sighed. You're so kind. Anyway, as you said, I'm neither the princess nor the curse. I have no interest in destroying the empire, the emperor, or dragons. His gaze, which had momentarily softened, quickly turned cold again. Now that you've awakened in that body, no one will stop. Neither the dragon protecting her, nor the emperor chasing you. As the conversation continued, Idrif's presence felt increasingly strong. I kept finding my gaze drawn to his graceful gestures and deep voice. Look, I don't understand these complicated circumstances. I just want to live a normal life. You have nothing to do with this. Are you still going to chase me? Complex emotions flashed in Idrif's eyes. Yes, because His Majesty the Emperor desires it so. This imperial lapdog! I was about to shout in anger, but his voice suddenly lowered. And so do I. What? His words made my heart race. Anger, confusion, and an unidentifiable emotion swirled within me. Suddenly, the strange space surrounding us dissipated in a flash of intense light. Boom! I blinked and found myself back in the original location, standing in the bustling street. I was still firmly gripping the pickpocket's arm. What was that just now? Was it a dream, or did I see a vision swept up by magic? While confused thoughts raced through my mind, the pickpocket suddenly cried out tearfully. Help! This monster is trying to kill me! What? Just give me back my bag, you bastard! I shouted in anger. What are you talking about? This is mine! The pickpocket yelled, seemingly wronged. At that moment, passers-by began to take notice of us. It's a robber! Look, everyone! That vicious woman is threatening this poor boy! A passerby pointed and shouted. No, wait, it's a misunderstanding. This Grimblin stole my things. I tried desperately to explain, but it seemed futile. Murmurs could be heard from the surroundings. What's going on? A robber. Oh my, how frightening. Why has such a dangerous person appeared in our peaceful town? Damn it, the pickpocket has escaped and I'm getting all the wrong attention. I fumed inwardly. Just then, a familiar voice was heard. Oh, Valentina, there you are. Edwin appeared, making a fuss. His brown hair fluttered slightly in the wind. Edwin? Darling, that was truly a fantastic performance. You never cease to amaze me. I looked at him with surprised eyes. Edwin smiled and addressed the surrounding people. Now everyone, don't be alarmed. The show ends here. We were just creating a touching moment of teaching a lesson to a mischievous Grimblin. I couldn't help but admire his smooth acting. Feel free to capture this in a painting, but be careful with your paints. Watch out for Grimblins and guard your bags well. Actually, it's best to be wary of everything. People's reactions began to change gradually. Ah, so it was just a show. I thought it was a bit odd. Could it be? Something seems off. Was that all really just acting? Another person asked with a suspicious look. Edwin smiled and answered. Of course, madam. Did you shed a tear? A woman looked at Edwin with an enchanted expression. My goodness, you're so handsome. When are you performing again? I must see it. Edwin came close to me and whispered. Valentina, play along. I looked at him with a puzzled expression, but soon understood the situation and joined in the act. Our street performances come without warning, so please enjoy our next unpredictable show. Edwin said to the audience. Clap, 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 clap. The sound of applause echoed. Whistle, bravo. What a wonderful performance. I hope I can see it from the beginning next time. Edwin took my hand and raised it, then bowed to the people. I awkwardly followed suit. We left the street behind the cheers of the people. The encounter with Idrif was still vivid in my mind, but I couldn't tell Edwin about it now. Instead, grateful for his witty solution, I moved forward with a mix of anticipation and anxiety about the adventure to come.
The purple mist slowly cleared, and Idrif's long eyelashes blinked slowly. His red eyes glowed in the darkness. He stood alone in the dimly lit headquarters tent. So, this is as far as the connection can go when magic is released. Idrif slowly reached into his chest and pulled out a pendant. Under the moonlight, the blue glowing pendant shimmered beautifully, like stars reflected in a calm lake on a night sky. His eyes became distant as he gazed at the pendant. The quiet air surrounding him seemed as if time itself had stopped. Suddenly, Valentina's voice echoed in his ears. As you said, I was indeed a slave soldier. Your subordinate killed me, and when I woke up, I was in this body. A wrinkle briefly appeared between his brows before smoothing out. Strange. How did a slave's soul connect with me? Confused questions flashed through his mind. He recalled Valentina's flustered expression and the fear reflected in her eyes. Idrif's fingertips grasped the pendant. The blue light reflected in the moonlight illuminated his sharp eyes. He brought the pendant to his lips. His eyes closed momentarily at the touch of the cold metal. A low voice escaped between his lips. This time, absolutely. The rest of his words dissolved into the night air. Idrif's expression changed to become as cold as frost. His hand, placing the pendant back into his chest, was as careful as if handling a treasure. His long black hair swayed gently in the night breeze. His retreating figure disappearing into the darkness seemed as solid as an ancient tree that had withstood the test of time. The story hidden behind that noble figure was known only to the stars in the night sky. Mutt and Mug Inn Postponing the guild visit to tomorrow, we headed to the inn. As we opened the door, the lively atmosphere of the bustling lobby greeted us. The laughter and chatter of visitors filled the space, and the sound of a minstrel's instrument playing in a corner added to the charming ambiance. I couldn't help but smile as I watched people tapping their feet and enjoying the merry tune. I love this music, Edwin raised an eyebrow slightly as he replied. This is such an old song. Trends come and go, I said playfully. Just then I froze as I overheard a conversation between travellers. Did you hear? They say the curse of Tartan has awakened. A curse? That's nonsense. I'd sooner believe pigs could fly. It's true. My friend in the Imperial Army says they're chasing after the curse of Tartan that's disappeared somewhere. I heard that too. They say the cursed forest has vanished now that the curse has awakened. The curse has awakened. Is this really the end of the Empire? I unconsciously lowered my head. My heart was pounding, even though there was no way they could recognise me. It was a natural reaction, given that Idrif was leading the Imperial forces in pursuit of me. Moreover, to be connected to him through magical power. It seems that's what happens when my power goes berserk without my control. I'd have to be careful not to connect with him again. However, there was an unexpected gain. I thought I'd need to meet Bourbon, but I'd obtained unforeseen information. A dragon protecting Princess Valentina. I'd heard dragons went extinct long ago. Normally, I'd have dismissed it as a baseless rumour, but in my current situation, I couldn't afford to do that. With the Empire chasing me, a dragon would be a formidable ally. I must find it. Well, Princess Valentina would know well. Idrif said if he was Princess Valentina, he'd know the dragon's location. So, I need to find out everything about the princess, then I'll naturally be able to locate the dragon. Are there any clues to be found in this body, exchanged for Princess Valentina's soul? I fell into thought, absently clenching and unclenching my hands. But then... What are you doing? Hurry up, I'm starving to death. Edwin oblivious to my inner turmoil, urged me on. Right, let's eat first and then think. I followed him to an empty table near the fireplace. The cosy atmosphere with the smell of meat wafting from the kitchen and the crackling sound of the fireplace gradually eased my tension. Edwin ordered grilled meat and ginger ale without even looking at the menu. I couldn't help but smile at his confident demeanour. 
Do you come here often? Ah, occasionally. He answered nonchalantly, but I could sense his affection for the place in his eyes. Your order is ready. A delicious looking meat dish was placed on the table. The fragrant smell of the perfectly grilled meat made my mouth water. Um, how much is this? I asked hesitantly. Edwin raised one eyebrow slightly and pointed at himself. You're paying? He nodded and said, It's a treat for my sweetheart, who's lost all her money. Edwin's words touched my heart. Thank you, I'll enjoy it, I replied energetically, stabbing the meat with my fork. As I put a mouthful of meat in my mouth, juicy flavour burst on my tongue. Ah, uh, mmm. Edwin handed me a glass of ginger ale and said, Eat slowly. Is it that delicious? Yes. I've never tasted anything like this before. It's so meaty. Edwin rested his chin on his hand and replied with a blank expression. Ah, oh, what an astonishing fact. Aren't you eating? I asked. Ha, huh, I'm too annoyed to eat. How can I swallow food when I let such a petty pickpocket get away? Come on, you worked hard running after him. Try some. It's so delicious. You need to eat to gather strength to catch those small fry. Edwin sighed and said, Ah, oh, it's fine. I'll eat later. Are you going to refuse food offered by your lover? We're acting right now, remember? You should show a more loving side at times like this. Edwin's eyes widened slightly. Hmm. I quickly put a large piece of meat on the fork and brought it right up to Edwin's mouth. Here, eat up. Edwin's eyes flashed with surprise at my bold action. Seeing his cheeks turn slightly red, I felt secretly pleased. His shy reaction at times like this was quite cute. All right, I'll try a little. Edwin reluctantly opened his mouth. A small cheer of victory rang in my heart. Then, feeling mischievous, I suddenly pulled the fork back. Edwin's mouth gaped in the air, having lost its target, and I couldn't help but burst into laughter. Pfft. Huh, didn't you say to try it? Edwin's eyes widened. What? Can't eat it. I said try it if you can, I said, giggling. Edwin's previously indifferent face finally relaxed, a playful smile spread across his lips. Oh really? Then I'll try it. Edwin confidently grasped my hand holding the fork. The moment his hand enveloped mine, I hesitated unconsciously at the warm touch. In that moment, Edwin guided my hand, bringing the meat to his mouth. I felt the soft touch of his lips on the fork's tip. Huh. Somehow this situation feels strangely familiar. Suddenly, the image of an unfamiliar man flashed before my eyes. The man's face was blurry, but his presence was intense. His broad shoulders and straight neck were like a painting. The gesture of offering fruit was gentle, and I could almost smell a faint fragrance. Elegant fingers gently holding someone's hand. Led by that hand, as I opened my mouth, a sweet piece of fruit was gently placed between my lips. Who is that person? I came to my senses, feeling my heart pounding. What's this? A strange feeling, a memory I don't know is surfacing. I tried to shake my head to erase the vision, but the lingering sensation didn't easily fade. Trying to act normally, I asked Edwin, How is it? Isn't it really delicious? Edwin thought for a moment, then said nonchalantly, Hmm, yes, this taste is like a heavenly song. Aren't you exaggerating a bit? I said with a chuckle. Well, there's a mix of slight fruit flavour and spicy herbs. Edwin pondered with a serious expression before continuing. Yes, in the end, meaty is the most appropriate expression. We looked at each other and burst into laughter simultaneously. Now, let me feed you this time, Edwin said, picking up the fork. I shook my head with a distrustful look at the food Edwin offered. I know you hate losing. You're going to play a trick, aren't you? No, unlike a certain someone, I won't offer and then take it away, Edwin said with a serious expression. I hesitated before bringing my mouth to the fork he held out, but before I could fully open my mouth the food was suddenly pushed in, leaving meat sauce all over my mouth. Wow! I can't believe you got your revenge so quickly, 
I said in a complaining tone while wiping my mouth. Edwin answered with gleeful laughter. Ha! Huh, sorry, sorry, I was too hasty. It's fine. Now that we've each given and received once, let's just eat on our own. Wait, there's still some left here. Before Edwin could finish speaking, his hand approached my mouth. As his thumb lightly brushed the corner of my lips, my heart suddenly leapt, and another scene unfolded before my eyes. Who is it? Wait. I... Princess Valentina. No. This is... me. But why like this? The scene before me was clearly the princess's memory. However, as if I were there myself, all of the princess's sensations were vividly transmitted. I saw the man who had flashed before me earlier sitting in front of me. His face was blurry, but his presence was clear. The air between us seemed to tremble subtly, the sweet taste of purple grapes between my lips, the echo of a rapidly beating heart. Knowing all this belonged to the princess, yet feeling it as my own. Even the playfulness and excitement in the gaze towards the man before me were conveyed intact. I leaned towards the man slowly, very slowly. My movement was imbued with elegance and subtle longing. The man also slightly bowed his head. His breath seemed to brush my cheek. Soon after, the man's gaze lingered on my lips. The heat from his fingertips spread through my entire body, making my heart race. The man began to move closer. His lips drew nearer to mine, which held the grape. As our breaths mingled into one, the tension in the air reached its peak. As if time had stopped, that fleeting moment felt like an eternity. This is the princess's memory. But why is it so vivid? It's as if I'm experiencing it myself. The boundary between reality and fantasy, between the princess and myself, blurred. In that instant, I was both the princess and myself. My face burned with embarrassment, just as our lips in the fantasy were about to touch. That's enough. I'm done eating now. Edwin's voice snapped me back to reality. He had apparently carefully wiped my mouth in the meantime. Seeing my flushed face, Edwin's ears turned red as he bit his lip and looked away. Just then, a sharp cry echoed across the inn towards us. Oh no! Miss! Watch out! Crash! Smash! Splash! In the blink of an eye, cold liquid poured all over me. The innkeeper, bustling between tables, had collided with a drunk guest and fallen, spilling the alcohol she was carrying directly onto me. Oh dear, I'm so sorry, miss. The innkeeper apologised with a flustered face. I was too shocked to speak, shivering as the cold alcohol ran down my body. The drunk was already unconscious, and the innkeeper shook her head at him, seemingly suppressing her anger. Edwin quickly approached and handed me a napkin. Oh no, are you all right? Ah, I'm fine. At least I won't have to worry about being thirsty now. I shrugged and gave a wry smile. Edwin frowned and spoke to the innkeeper. What should we do? I don't think napkins will be enough. I'm truly sorry. This is my responsibility. I'll provide you with our best room with a bath, free of charge. Really? That's great, I responded brightly. A relieved smile spread across the innkeeper's face. Oh, wonderful. That room is very popular with couples. You two will be able to enjoy a very romantic atmosphere. At the innkeeper's words, Edwin and I exchanged surprised glances. Romantic? A couple's room? I looked at Edwin with a bewildered expression. His face also showed clear embarrassment. He seemed to be trying not to make eye contact with me. We really appreciate your consideration, but such an elaborate room isn't necessary. Just a place to wash up and rest would be enough. The innkeeper shook her head with an apologetic expression. I'm sorry, but all other rooms are fully booked today. This is the only room available. Edwin finally looked at me. A strange emotion lingered in his deep blue eyes. Shall we go? He asked in a low voice. Hasty Cake Club, where every bite is a taste of sweet adventure. Ready for a more adventurous flavour in your life? Subscribe and taste the magic.